Conflict has been identified as one of the biggest obstacles to progress towards the education for all goals. And so this year's Global Monitoring Report focuses on some of the poorest countries that are in conflict, around 35 countries that are either currently in conflict or are emerging from conflict. And what we've tried to, un un to, to look at and to understand in the report is first of all, how is armed conflict impacting on education systems? Because this, this is not an issue that is typically in the headlines. When people think about armed conflict, they think about refugee flows, they see the images on television of tanks and soldiers, but we wanted to look behind those images and to ask the question, what is the long-term impact on education systems of, of these violent conflicts around the world? The effects of armed conflict on education systems is, is absolutely devastating. And you can capture part of that impact in hard statistics. We know, for example, that there are around 28 million children in conflict-affected countries who are out of school. That's 40% of all children who are out of school are, are in conflict-affected countries. We know that the child death rates in these countries are twice as high as they are in other countries. We know that this is a group of countries that have some of the lowest rates of transition from primary school to secondary school, the lowest literacy rates, the biggest gender inequalities. So these are all the headline numbers and the data that we explore in the report. But what we also try and look at in the report is, is what are the factors and the forces that are driving these outcomes? And, and that is really a very disturbing message because the, the central theme that emerges is that school children and schools are now systematically being targeted by armed groups, by government armed groups, by armed militias for acts of violence. It's not the case that education systems and kids are being caught in the crossfire, that there are sort of collateral damage. It's that these groups in many countries are systematically targeting education and school children. And, and that is really the hidden crisis at the heart of the report. Go governments need to start by biting the bullet and protecting the human rights of children who are on the front line. The attacks on schools that we document in the report, the attacks on, on school children, are not only ethically indefensible, they're a clear violation of international law. And nowhere do you see a more egregious violation than in when it comes to rape and sexual violence. We document one country after another, the Sudan, Chad, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, where armed groups are acting with impunity in carrying out acts of, of rape and sexual violence against children. These are criminal acts. They're a clear violation of the international responsibilities on, on governments and non-government actors to protect children. And so we call in the report on governments to act to defend human rights. We want to see an international commission created to investigate rape and widespread sexual violence. We want to see the International Criminal Court involved in, in that commission. And in cases where governments are unwilling to do what they're supposed to do, which is to protect vulnerable children, we believe that the dossier should be passed to the International Criminal Court and appropriate action taken. There are many other things that need to happen uh, at the international level. The aid community is turning its back on children who are in conflict-affected situations. To give one example, in the report, we, in, in the research that we carried out for the report, we interviewed parents and children in conflict-affected uh, countries that are making the most extraordinary, and I think one would say heroic, efforts to get their children an education. These are families who, are lost, who have lost everything, who are living in camps for displaced people, who are living in the bush, who are living on riverbanks, who are trying to recreate schools. These are, are parents and kids who are giving it their best shot. You couldn't say the same for the international aid community. Education gets something like 2% in total of humanitarian aid. No sector has a bigger shortfall between requests for humanitarian aid and the delivery of humanitarian aid. That is an indefensible position. By immediately moving to provide education, governments and donors can generate a very quick peace premium. That, you know, this education is something that figures very prominently in the lives of poor people. And if they can see that peace delivers new opportunities in education, it can help to build the legitimacy of the government to strengthen the resilience of the peace process. But 
here too, all too often we see aid donors delaying their response, moving it in a very half-hearted way, and then the piece unraveling.